Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The Transfiguration is a, a well... It's one of those events in the Gospels, in the Synoptic Gospels at least, that is truly puzzling on some level because things happen and they don't quite make a whole lot of sense. That Jesus Christ was transfigured in the face of Peter, James, and John, and his glory was shown, but not the fullness of his glory, And what I don't mean is that it's not that if the fullness of his glory had shown, they would have been blinded, they would have been killed, they would have been, you know, destroyed entirely. We know that from the Old Testament with Moses, with Elijah. That in the showing of God's glory, there is wrath for sin. And so you have to ask yourself, what exactly did they see? They saw some glimpse of what would be. But it's very interesting also that with this great sight, they were given this command, tell no one about what you saw until the Son of Man is raised from from the dead. Why not? Why not tell people what a wonderful thing you saw on that mountain? Why not tell everyone we saw Jesus transfigured and his pure glory and the glory of God shone through him and we were so dumbstruck that we didn't even know what to say. Peter said something ridiculous, right? Peter says, Lord, it is good that we are here. Thanks, Peter. Captain Obvious. It's great to be here, right? Good job, Peter. You did a good job. It's good to be here. It really is. And then he says, further... Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. Let's just stay right here. Let's stay right here, Lord, because we want to be in this place forever and worship you and you can be comfortable with Moses and Elijah and y'all can just keep on talking. But it's, it's great that uh, we see that Peter is really like us. That when we see something that is just glorious, it is just full of God's majesty and wonder. We are just slack-jawed and we search for words to say. Some of us find certain words, but none of the words we pick ever quite do it justice. And we know this because while Peter was still speaking, a bright cloud came upon them and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. I I keep saying this every year on transfiguration, but it bears repeating. Shh, be quiet. Listen to Jesus. What you have to say on certain things apart from Jesus is nothing in comparison to what he has to say. We are only given the things that he is supposed to say, that, that we are supposed to say all the things that he says. We're only given the things that he gives us to say. So that when they hear this, they fall fall on their faces and are terrified. Because the voice of God is a thunder, right? That in the same way, the children of Israel, when they saw the bright thunderings and the dark cloud on Mount Sinai and they heard God speaking, they were absolutely terrified, and rightly so. The glory of God brings wrath For sin. And so, with this, we see that Peter corrects his his words in his epistle, where he says that we have heard the voice. We have heard that voice that was born to us by the majestic glory, born to him, that this is my beloved son with whom I am, with whom I am whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on that holy mountain. And yet, and yet, we have something more sure. The prophetic word, 
to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining through a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Because Peter doesn't want us to know, rightly so, according to the Holy Spirit, he does not want us to think that we need to behold Jesus transfigured in order to see the fullness of his glory. He wants us to know that we can hear about it and that that actually is better than seeing. What happened when Peter, James, and John saw the fullness of God's glory? They were just dumbstruck and their words escaped them. So that what happened afterwards And what Jesus had to tell them about what happened afterward is really what makes all the difference in the world. That the word, hearing, is better than seeing. To show you that Mount Calvary is actually greater than the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus didn't want them to say certain things about what they saw until after what was really important had taken place. Don't tell anyone about what you saw until, until, until the Son of Man is raised from, from the dead. Now there's also something to be taken into account here, and thankfully we have um, different accounts of this event from Mark and from Luke. And from Luke we might actually understand a little bit about why Peter said what he said. More so than that, it was just a wonderful thing to see and he didn't want to leave. There's more to it than that. That Luke says that Jesus was talking with, 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 excuse me, with Moses. And Elijah about his coming, about his coming, excuse me, about his coming departure. The Greek word is about his his coming exodus, right? That what they were talking about was what they had hoped for, the death of Christ the redemption of sinners, the washing clean of all those who sin and fall short of the glory of God. It's what they were waiting for. And what better thing do they have to talk about? So if Peter hears this, which a chapter before, he had heard this from Jesus himself, that Jesus said that the Son of Man must be killed and then on the third day be raised. And Peter, after making such a great confession, says, far be it from you, Lord. This should never happen to you, to which Jesus says, get behind me, Satan, for your, your eyes are set on the things of man and not on, and not on the things of God. Simon still can't quite stomach the fact that Jesus has to die for him. Peter says, well, let me just stop them from talking about that because that can't be as good as what's going on right now. To which, thankfully, God the Father chimes in and corrects Peter. So what does this mean for us today? Where is God's glory found? Because if we know that God's glory and the revelation of his glory means wrath for sin, where was the wrath for sin fully shown? But on that mountain that was barren and filled with nothing but pain and suffering. It was in that place where the Son of Man had been crucified and where he screamed out in pain and torment where his blood flowed freely to pay for the sins of the world. That in that place, God's glory is truly shown because wrath for sin is shown in its fullness. God's wrath is poured out on Jesus. 
for our sakes. That now, when we behold Him in the pain and the suffering of the cross, we behold God's glory. As I was preparing for this, it's really a testament to the cross references that you find through a Bible. I was trying to find something, something to hold on to that was a little bit different. You know, you don't want to make a sermon that happens year after year totally different. You need to hit on the main points. But one thing I did find was a cross reference to 2 Corinthians 3.18, where St. Paul says, And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of beholding the glory of of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another for this comes from the Lord who is the spirit that we now by God's grace can behold God's glory it is still somewhat veiled but at the same time it is shown in its fullness in in its fullness by seeing what happens to Jesus for our sake that we see his glory and in seeing his glory in seeing the pain that he suffered in seeing the torment in seeing the blood pouring out and the life gone from Christ we see And we are transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. That we as Christians now are called to pick up our cross and follow him. That our life is not one of painlessness, of comfort, of ease. Our life as Christians is a fight. We fight a spiritual fight, a spiritual battle. And yet, the pain and suffering that we faced is nothing in comparison to what Christ has faced for us. Not that we should feel guilty, but that we should be encouraged. For the pain that he suffered, the cross that he bore, was for our sake. So that we know that he is beside us. That he suffers the same things that we do. That our battle is made just a little bit easier. In fact, it's made infinitely easier, infinitely more bearable, because we know that the war has already been won. That in Christ, sin has been paid for. Sin has been conquered. The devil has been defeated. And this world has been overcome by Christ. Likewise, uh, um, likewise, um, the unholy trinity, the devil, the world, and our, our sinful flesh has been, has been brought, brought into reign, brought under the control of Christ. So that, as we read in 1 Timothy chapter 4, We should train ourselves up for godliness. And godliness is so important and very much, very much, excuse me, very much um, neglected today. Because a lot of people think that they have a lot of time or that they should spend their time in different ways that don't have to do with this. But we know from scripture, from God's word, that godliness is of is of of value in every way as it holds a promise for the present life and also for the life to come the saying is trustworthy and 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 excuse me and deserving of full of of and deserving of full acceptance for to this end we toil and strive because we have our hope set on the the living god who is the savior of all people especially to those who 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 excuse me who believe 
that in our lives, our hardship trains us up, trains us up in godly, in, in godliness. Excuse me. Because it is profitable for here and now and there in eternity. In our training, we keep the cross always before our eyes. We keep the glory of God shown in Christ always before our eyes. We see the fullness of law and gospel met out on the cross. That on Jesus, the wrath for our sin is hung, and yet the forgiveness of sins is granted at the same time. So the cross is our glory. And in our training, we keep it before our eyes. With unveiled face, we behold the glory of Christ's cross. And thus, the Lord transforms us according to the glory of his cross. And being trained in godliness means we are trained to fight the spiritual fights that are before us. My fight is different than y'all's. Everyone has their own cross that they need to bear. Our struggles against the devil, the world, and the sinful flesh can actually often cause us to throw up our hands and say, what's the point? Why should I keep on going? I'm tired. I'm dirty. I'm out of breath. I just can't do it anymore. Sometimes it gets to be too much. And sometimes we can say things to ourselves that seem to be comforting at the time, but because our heart is desperately sick and wicked and sinful, it even uses the good sayings and the good words of God for sinful ends. Sometimes we get so tired from fighting this fight that we say to ourselves, well, you know, God is still in control. That means that I can just sit back. That means that I can just let it all go and not do what God has given me to do. Not pray. Not work. Not strive in faith. We can use this great saying, God is still in control for our own sinful ends. And while it is still true, we need to actually know what it means. It does not mean that nothing that I do matters. Instead, we should see that for the false humility that it is and covers up our cowardice or our 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 cowardice or our our laziness to fight the spiritual fight. Instead, we should say God is still in control and know that that is the encouragement that we need to go ahead and keep on fighting to keep fighting the spiritual fights that we have before us, to fight the good fight of faith, to know that God is still in control is the encouragement because it makes your every action matter. It means that what you do in faith matters. It means that the suffering that you go through is not in vain. It means that the, cry, that the cross that Christ has borne for you has been borne for other people that need to know it too. God has called you to fight the good fight of faith when and where you are. Like I said, my fight is not your fight, all in the same sense. We all strive to the end that we try and subdue our sinful flesh and fight against the devil and, and this world. So if there's some training in godliness I can give to you, something to keep in mind, it's that as we go forward from here, coming down from this, this great, this great, excuse me, this great mountain where we are with unveiled face seeing God's glory through his word and through his sacraments, that when you come up here and you are given his body and his blood, you hold him firmly in your hands, and he lives now in you in a very real sense in the body and the blood that he feeds you with, that with these things you behold his glory, you proclaim his death until he comes again. And in doing all these things, we go out to this world and we face those fights. So face those fights being equipped 
Fight the good fight of faith. Knowing that God is still in control. That he makes sure that what you do actually matters. Be in the fray that God has called you to. Don't be above it. Fight with all that God gives you until your last breath. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen.